Uh, if uh, those of you hanging out in the back could come on in and grab a seat, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much for coming out to hear our speaker this morning. Uh, in just a moment, I'll introduce Makoto Fujimura, our speaker for this first Monday of November. I was reading uh, his book, Culture Care, last week, and about halfway through, I stumbled across a definition of beauty that was at once aesthetically elegant and philosophically precise. I could imagine St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, or even Abraham Kuyper reading this paragraph and nodding in vigorous approval. Fujimura writes this. Beauty is the quality connected with those things that are in themselves appealing and desirable. Beautiful things are a delight to the senses, a pleasure to the mind, and a refreshment for the spirit. Beauty invites us in, capturing our attention and making us want to linger. Beautiful things are worth our scrutiny, rewarding to contemplate, deserving of pursuit. They inspire or even demand a response, whether sharing them in community or acting to extend their beauty into other spheres." Unquote. A good teacher of mine from my graduate school days liked to point out beautiful things. He'd do this at the most unexpected times. We'd be walking back from a late evening seminar talking pretentiously about metaphysics or Kierkegaard or some other such nonsense, and he'd say, stop, look. And he'd point to a beautiful crescent moon casting a strange shadow on the stone walkway ahead of us. Or when he would have us over for dinner, he would put on some Miles Davis or Johnny Coltrane and ask his guests, most of us as white as white could be, to attend to the brilliance of the jazz riff that none of us had ever heard before or knew how to enjoy. Or he'd read from Henry Thoreau's transcendentalist book, Walden. Many of us found Walden ponderous, a text that was somehow as dense as the philosophy as Hegel and as self-involved as Kim Kardashian's Twitter feed. But this teacher would point out the little details, the ax that Thoreau borrowed from his friend Ralph Waldo Emerson, which he needed to build his house, an allusion here to the Psalms or there to the apocalypse of St. John, or to the fleeting presence of the unnamed fugitive slave whom Thoreau helped escape to Canada. I should note, this teacher was a confirmed atheist, but he saw the grace notes that inflect all of life. It takes a trained eye to catch the glimmer of beauty in shrouded places. It takes a patient spirit to summon us out of our distracted world, bombarded as we are by sensorial data on social media, the news, or even in our domestic lives. Makoto Fujimura, in his written and visual art, has the trained eye and the patient spirit to call us to attention. Stop. Look. If you linger with his work, maybe you will begin to see what he sees to find beauty, layer upon layer of it, in all the graced, ordinary spaces you inhabit. So to introduce our speaker, Makoto Fujimura is director of the Culture Care Initiative at Fuller Seminary's Brem Center. He is an artist, writer, and speaker who is recognized worldwide as a shaper of contemporary culture. A presidential appointee to the National Council on the Arts from 2003 to 2009, Fujimura served as an international advocate for the arts, speaking with decision makers and advising governmental policies on the arts. In 2014, the American Academy of Religion named Fujimura as its 2014 Religion and the Arts Award recipient. His work has been exhibited at galleries around the world, including Dillon Gallery in New York, the Contemporary Museum of Tokyo, Vienna's Belvedere Museum, the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., and now at Dort College in Sioux Center, Iowa. He's the author of several books, including Culture Care, Reconnecting with Beauty for Our Common Life, and also served as a special advisor for Martin Scorsese's production of the film Silence. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Good morning, so great to be here on November the 5th um, in Iowa, of all places. I, I'm going to begin by inviting you into my studio in Pasadena. This photo was taken by my friend Stephen Proctor, uh, who was uh, part of uh, this Culture Care Week, and he came into the studio, and my assistant, Eric Tai, who is here with me, 
um, took these ma ma micro photos of my work. My work doesn't translate that well into a uh, slide presentation. I'm going to try today. But the best thing to do is to invite you into my creative process uh, in my studio. So I'm going to show you a video of a series of videos that we are creating. And I want to thank Wind Rider Production for uh, uh, bringing people to record my session on culture care and theology of making in the studio. I am literally painting and speaking about theology at the same time. And you will notice uh, three people uh, represented in this video. One is a philosopher, Esther Meek who uh, teaches at Geneva College. She's a good friend uh, and, and a, a really important colleague for me to rely on as a philosopher. How do we uh, view this bifurcated reality uh, in, in culture today and how to navigate the polarities and divisiveness that exists in, um, in, in this culture. And as an artist, what I'm trying to do is to mediate and I will say that um, journalists and media is supposed to mediate, but they do not. Uh, mediation is the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you are a budding journalist, I want to encourage you to mediate, which means to tell the truth, but also do it in a way that is forbearing and loving of culture. Um, I have two other friends in the video that briefly make an appearance. One is Dr. Th uh, Kurt Thompson, who is a psychiatrist in DC. He wrote a wonderful book called Anatomy of the Soul. And he literally has been uh, studying the effect of beauty and how beauty can rewire the brain. Um, and another friend, Pete Candler, who is a writer. Uh, he used to be the uh, great books professor at Baylor University, uh, now a writer. Um, so um, I am painting and speaking about um, my passion, which is to uh, bring beauty into the world, uh, both in terms of creating and, and talking about it. So let me see if I can go. I have to, oops, here we go, okay. Kojimura Studio, where we enter into this journey of theology of making. What are we missing when we talk about what the Christians call the gospel? How do we see the whole picture? I will, throughout this week, talk about poetry and theater and dance and all of the arts that will showcase this God. I don't think I've ever given an epistemology talk in such a beautiful setting, so this is very exciting. There's one requirement you need to be philosophical, and that is to be born. To be human is to live philosophical questions. We come out of the womb looking for someone looking for us. We're not looking to know if we're doing the right thing. We're looking for someone looking for us. That's what our brains are doing. Uh, life, uh, and particularly Christian life, is a kind of recovery. When you make, God shows up. And so here we are, right? We are in this studio. Why? It's because I believe that the future of the church looks like this. What an audacious statement, right? You're in the midst of creating in the studio, or maybe you're on stage as a dancer, maybe in a quiet corner of your room as a poet, writing uh, in that 17 and a half by 17 and a half inch desk, uh, waking up three in the morning and looking over your window in Amherst, Massachusetts, in a little town, and uh, writing these poems that no one thought they would need. But Emily Dickinson wrote every day, waking up at three in the morning on that 17 and a half inch by 17 and a half inch uh, 
cherry wood table. And so the arts, artists and poets and writers, uh, dancers, um, we all endeavor to do um, what we are called to do. And yet th that work is often dismissed in the world as unnecessary and marginal and extravagant. And you've, if you are an artist in this room, you have heard this all and over and over in your life. Um, that, that, you know, if you're going to go to college, do something practical. You know, don't uh, major in auto literature. I mean, uh, you, don't, you can't get a job doing that, right? But uh, um, recently I was speaking to several deans of engineering schools, and I was in this conversation about the future of engineering. And they were saying that the, the skills, the convergent skills that they teach their students in engineering is going to be basically ineffective in five years. Engineering used to be about building bridges that would last. <clears throat> but it has changed now because you're talking about creating materials right, in material sciences to build the future bridges. And they said this astonishing thing to me, the most important thing for the engineer students is to study the arts, to understand what beauty means, to look for that in solving the real life, life problems of the world. And today, as we face tomorrow, in this divided culture, uh, in, in this time, which has been particularized by this divisiveness and this reality that we all feel dehumanized in, fragmented, I have to remind myself that this task of seeking and creating beauty is not just so that we can be entertained. That the very survival of who we are as a human race is at stake. And I keep thinking about what, 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 called, what called me to do this. As a child, I remember uh, loving colors, and um, I was born in Boston, but I, um, I went to several years in Sweden. And uh, my father is a research scientist, a renowned speech and hearing scientist. And uh, I painted something that my mother kept when I was two. <laughs> And um, that shows that I had a great uh, upbringing of parents who were very encouraging to me uh, as an artist. Um, and the colors that I used uh, when I was two is exactly the colors I use today. <laughs> and these materials are Nihonga, which is Japanese-style paintings, these 17th century materials that was used in Japan technique that was refined over time and in 20th century became Nihonga. Um, and these materials pulverize minerals and gold and silver, uh, hide glue mixed, and we're going to do a workshop. Eric's going to um, do that uh, on Tuesday. But this whole aesthetic uh, flows out of Japanese um, past is, is an entry point for me to engage with my imagination to, to see not only what the, the painting can bring into the world, but really understand that in the slowness of the process of painting, I call slow art, it's just like slow food <laughs> movement. It is uh, intentionally slowed down. The materials take a long time to process and prepare. 
Um, and you're talking about an ecosystem of artisans throughout Japan that is actually endangered. There are paper makers and brush makers and people who, for generations, invested their time in refining materials. And their whole purpose is, is to serve the artist, craft something that means something to the society, to create beauty. And this long-term investment, the slow art of, of creating beauty, is part of my lineage and part of what I studied as a graduate student in Japan. And um, I thought going to Japan, looking at my roots directly would help me as an artist, but what happened was uh, I became a Christian in that process. Surprisingly, Christ entered into my life through works of William Blake and so many others that um, I read and studied in college. So to me, liberal arts education <laughs> literally saved my life. And I want to tell you, um, just as a side note here, that um, I believe uh, I'm on the board of trustees of my alma mater, Bucknell University. I think about the future of education, but I believe that Christian liberal arts universities are going to play the central uh, part in preserving the education of the full person, <laughs> preserving what is good, true, and beautiful in society. So Dolt College, what you are about, and soon to be a university, is going to play a central role in the future of not just Christian education, but education. It is critical to have this education that grows imagination, not just so that you can be artists and poets, but so that you can be better engineers, better doctors, better nurses, better mothers and better fathers. We have to begin to look at imagination, particularly moral imagination, as a critical place of formation for human beings, but particularly for Christians. We have been very neglectful of this in the past centuries. And today, we are found to be lacking in leadership. And I, my, my work uh, as, a, as an artist, but as a leader, is to help people reimagine the future, right? And an artist's task is to bring the future into the present, make the invisible visible. And here behind me is a large painting, seven feet by 11 feet, uh, uh, called Rhapsody. And this is a painting that I'm donating to Bucknell University for the new building, um, a school of management. And you would think, like, you know, why not a school, a school for the arts? And uh, I intentionally didn't want to do that because I, I wanted to be part of this new way of educating young leaders who are management majors, but they, they are going to be overlapping with, with the arts and um, theater. And uh, the future of business is going to depend on leaders who understand beauty. And so here I am painting this in my farm in Princeton. Um, my assistant, Alison uh, LaCroix, who's a fantastic photographer, took these photos while helping me carry these huge, heavy works. And um, this is uh, what happens in the summer in my farm, and um, it's very agrarian. You know, you're taking care of the land, and you're painting at the same time. Uh, here's my barn. Um, and uh, two horses lived there before I started to use it. So they moved to Vermont, and I got, to, got their permission to use the uh, space. 
And this act of painting uh, is very healing for me. Uh, it is, it is uh, one of the mainstays of who I am as a person, who, where I uh, speak out of. Um, I, I would not be able to speak to you today if I wasn't painting. I would not be able to write these books if I wasn't in a studio painting. Everything flows out of that rhythm. Um, it is the most sacred space for me. <laughs> I don't, I, 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 I get to have my quiet time uh, in my studio making. Because as I said in the video, uh, when you make, God shows up. The spirit hovers and I am free to see myself differently and see this very situation of uh, challenges and traumas all around me differently. So I need that space and I, I've been very fortunate to carve out that space. And so Theology of Making, these, the video curriculum that will be distributed um, really um, worldwide um, through Fuller's uh, new leadership platform, uh, is, is, is going to be available to you, um, so uh, be on the lookout for that. And um, I want to help all of us journey into that creative space where we can grow in our imagination, in integrating a, a knowledge base, uh, left brain to right brain, um, activities, all of who we, what makes us human to find a deeper place of belonging and beholding. We are meant to belong. We are meant to behold. We, are we Without those activities, of um, essential activities, we lose ourselves. We, we get fragmented and thrown about by, by the wind of our times. And so, I wrote Culture Care as a result of going around this country as a National Council member uh, advocating for the arts very broadly. I, um, I did it in all sorts of sectors, um, nonprofits, uh, um, very secular spaces, so-called, um, to sometimes churches. But I began to write about this in essay form, each of the chapter in chapters in Culture Care uh, is, is a um, lecture. So you can actually spend time with each, each, each part, um, to, uh, thinking about why beauty matters and what is the role of the arts in our lives. Uh, even uh, my goal is uh, hopefully by the end of the book that even if you're not an artist, that uh, you will know that y you are indeed a maker of some kind that you are involved in, whether by supporting it or by uh, being part of the process journey of um, creating the future together, that, that this, this act of making will, will define us. And without that part, we will always be acting as, as giving this knee-jerk reaction to, to what's going on around us. We have to be in the act of making together, as especially as people of God. So T.S. Eliot, whose work uh, has, has seminal influence on my work, and, and some of the prints you see in, in the gallery, uh, reflective of that, and I'll share more this afternoon. But he's, he made this astonishing statement in, in this wonderful book called Notes Toward uh, Definition of Culture. He said, if we take culture seriously, we see that people does not need merely enough to eat, but a proper and particular cuisine. Culture may even be described simply as that which makes life worth living. Culture may even be described simply as that which makes life worth living. Isn't that an astonishing statement? Because we wake up in the morning, right? And we think about the culture in which we live. And that is not the culture. Our culture does not make our lives worth living today. We do not look forward getting out of bed this morning Maybe some of us are blessed enough 
to look forward to something. But the, the atmosphere of culture today is so toxic that you want to run away from it. <laughs> it is not life-giving. So, so why did T.S. Eliot, of all people, say this in post-war times in England when things were even maybe bleaker, uh, more contentiousness at, at hand and, and anxiety and fear of the future. And I, I, I think it's because he believed that this growth of imagination that he would be able to guide us into through the darkness and trials of our times into a place where all of us can journey into creation of this culture which makes life worth living for all people, not just for ourselves, but for all people. And culture care basically is the assimilation uh, and fulfillment of what St. Paul talked about in Galatians, uh, the fruit of the Spirit passage that many of us may memorize when, if you're trained in, in parachurches or churches to, uh, as part of a discipleship, it is about being filled with the Spirit. And, and Paul says that the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's the word is agape. And I, I have a column there afterwards, which is um, my own translation. Actually, I, I got that from Tim Keller. Um, but... Uh, uh, I, everything that follows love is, is, is what describes love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, we spend a lot of time passing this out in our lives, and we should. We, we pray for this in our lives, and we should. But I ask this one deadly question. And that is, okay, that's fine for me to pray for this and work towards this and uh, have accountability towards this, but what about our culture at large? If we go along with T.S. Eliot, I have to ask that question, what about our culture? And I, was, I just gave a keynote uh, lecture at Bader University's Stewardship, Stewardship of Creation um, conference and I was writing about reality of today, the toxic reality of today, uh, of culture, uh, but that's linked to the environment, the reality of what we are facing, the, 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 this uh, lack of both leadership and imagination toward stewarding a culture and, and nature. And, and I, I, I was writing it, and I, I, I wrote this sentence, which which really um, haunted me as I thought about it. When I asked this question, can this reality of the fruit of the Spirit, the ideal for which Christians, all Christians should aspire to, is it affecting culture? Of all the years of what we have done as Christians to help the world, <laughs> How are we doing? And I wrote this sentence. Christianity today is seen in the world as exhibiting an outward face of hatred instead of love, fear instead of joy, anxiousness instead of peace, judgmentalism instead of forbearance, jealous exclusion instead of kindness, narcissism, instead of goodness, fear field, cynicism, instead of faithfulness, uncontrollable rage, instead of self-control. The world does not see us as being filled with the fruit of the spirit people. Now, that's an indictment, and I own that <laughs> as a leader. But I share this honestly because of what T.S. Eliot is talking about. It doesn't have to be this way. And so I 
road to culture care as a possibly uh, a way for us to move forward, uh, realizing how far we have fallen short of the glory of God, and this reality that God will have us endeavor to do in the world, and to affect culture so that culture is thriving and worth waking up in the morning to look forward to. And I suggest three ways, and I, I won't go into these very uh, in detail. I talk about three Gs, and actually it's now four Gs of, of gener uh, creating a generative life toward how we may find thriving in communities and our, our, um, our homes and in our lives toward um, where everyone, including those who don't consider themselves to be artists, to be part of this generating of the fruit of the Spirit in culture. So number one is um, consider every moment, every setback as Genesis moments. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I tell you for sure that many will be disappointed. And at that moment, it's important for us to remember that disappointment or whatever the setback you feel is happening in this country, that it's a genesis moment. It's not the end, but it's the beginning of something new. And we, artists are trained in this. Talk to a musician or artist or poet, they know what this is because they had to face the scarcity mindset reality, pragmatic bottom line thinking reality all the time. They would not be writing songs or painting or getting up on the stage to dance if they didn't understand this, if they didn't have to face it every single moment, and they had to preach to themselves that, no, I am called to this, despite what the world tells me, to be practical and to fulfill the functions of society mechanically. There's so much more to me, and there's so much more to the world than pragmatic, utilitarian pragmatism, bottom line. They fight this all the time, and they can help you to see every moment as a genesis moment, that beholding the world, there, 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 there's magic, even in the bleakest moments. And second one, I quickly, is, is to tell artists to be generous. Don't be narcissistic <laughs> and worry about their self-expression. <laughs> be generous. Give away their life. Give away the gifts, and that I will lead you to find your gifts. Actually, ironically, paradoxically, it is by giving away your life and your expression that you'll find your expression. you find your life. And that this is a generational task. It doesn't happen on one Tuesday morning. It has to go beyond our children and their children and I asked this question, 500-year question, which is an essay that you can find on my website. I thought about how I may um, leave you with something. And um, it would be easy to uh, give you thoughts, my own thoughts. And, um, um, but I do that in my books. And <laughs> you have my art here. And... Um, you're listening to me now. And, but I thought I, I will give you a song. And this is a song by someone I'm mentoring, a singer-songwriter whose pastor was a Nigerian pastor. She lives in Philadelphia. And she's in my cohort group, uh, a group of artists that I'm mentoring. These are professional artists who have had their rounds of battles, um, of success and failures, and, but I believe in their work, and um, I wanted to do what I can to help them. Her name is Joy Ike. Great name, because she is literally filled with joy. 
And this song is called Hold On. And I think it is the anthem of our time. No matter which side of the aisle you sit on politically or if you're <laughs> sitting out on this one or <laughs> if you feel so discouraged that uh, nothing you do will ever matter or maybe you're excited about what the future holds or maybe you're an educator thinking about uh, the values that you want to help the young people to walk away from this university. I think that this is a song for you. So I'm going to play it, and I'm going to just conclude with some thoughts. But this is a, call, a song called Hold On. Like a candle burning in the dark like the good skin underneath the sky It's not what you want But your hope is coming Like an oak tree underneath the ground A small seed waiting to come out It's not what you want But your hope is coming Life takes all you got But your hope is coming
So what is culture care? It is to write a song that everyone can sing. Doesn't matter what you believe. I believe that Christians are called to write song, write paint, write words, to be on stage where this fullness of God, this full thriving of God, this abundance of God breaks into the world. There's no other paradigm through which that can happen other than the biblical paradigm. The world is dying, yes. But there's good news. <laughs> we may be limited in our resources, our talents, and our gifts, but I submit to you that in this room there is enough gifts, enough talent, enough resources, enough wisdom to change the world. But we have to take, take that risk and write that song because it is hard to be honest and think of a way where you can have this, you can make the statement that you are not your fear. Only artists can do that. But I think it, um, it, to, to have this convincing way of bringing beauty into the world is to turn from fear into love. And the gospel message allows us to fully become that artist. And so when I say only artists can do that, I'm not just saying, like, occupationally, people who are artists and singers and, you know, theater directors. I, I'm talking about all of us. We are all artists guided by the artist, the biblical God of creation, the Holy Spirit who points the way to the Son. And we can come to a point <laughs> in our journey where we, we can truly say that, yes, we have been part of a journey, maybe a generational struggle, but a journey toward abundance. And this is a pear tree in my backyard. Um, this painting is called Kiseki, which means a miracle. This old pear tree, which um, the former owners told uh, me that they, it may not flower again, and uh, first year it didn't, and, and, and so I, I, I thought it was, you know, may need to be cut down. And the second year it just blossomed, just came, uh, came alive, and there was so much fruit on it that we, we couldn't use it all. <laughs> and this pear reminds me, this old pear tree reminds me that even what things that people consider to be dead or maybe inactive, can come alive again, and how, how, how that blossom, of the beauty of that blossom reminds me that even the tree of Christianity, tree of education, tree of what we hope for, that we are holding on to, can come back to flourish again. And so I hope that this day, um, as we consider what it means to be beautiful, what it means to create beauty, how to grow our imagination, how to think about our lives as part of this journey toward making, this theology of making that allows us to see that our hands and what we make can be connected to the deep theological reality of how God created the world and how we are invited to co-create with this creator today. Thank you for your uh, patient listening. Um, I will be around to uh, answer questions, and God bless you. <laughs>